Captain Louis Rudd, uh, served in the British Army for 34 years. I'm, I'm still actually serving now, uh, so it shows how old I am. Uh, I joined up at 16 years old. Uh, and during that time, I've been really fortunate um, to be able to go on some amazing adventures um, and expeditions down in Antarctica. Uh, and the plan is I'm going to uh, touch on three of those expeditions uh, this evening, uh, probably talk for about half an hour, uh, and then there'll be an opportunity at the end uh, to do Q&A. Uh, and please feel free to ask absolutely anything you like uh, about on what I'm going to cover. Uh, and whenever I go to, uh, to schools, at the moment I'm doing a five-month uh, youth engagement plan back in the UK off the back of the expedition. And whenever I go to primary schools, the first question the kids always ask is, how did you go to the toilet? And uh, if, you, if you want to ask that and how I managed to do three expeditions with no toilet paper, uh, you know, I'm more than happy to get into the gory detail you know, uh, around that. So, uh, <laughs> Okay, hopefully uh, this will work. Great. Um, I won't dwell on this. When I, when I go to the schools, I do a quick geography lesson uh, with the kids and, and talk about Antarctica uh, and this incredible continent that sits down the bottom of our planet. Uh, and it's surprising how little you know, the sort of kids know about this place. Uh, but suffice to say, you know, it's a place of extremes. Uh, it's had the coldest recorded temperature on the planet Earth, uh, minus 93 degrees centigrade, you know, in the depths of winter. Um, and you know, if you went outside at minus 93 and, and took down your hood and took off your goggles, then within a minute or so, the fluid in your eyeballs is going to start to freeze up. So, uh, you know, so pretty chilly, um, you know. But, uh, you know, fortunately, during my time down there in the, in the summer season, uh, all the way through November, December, January, you know, not as cold as that. The lowest I got down to was, was minus 53. Uh, and I'll show you some somewhat imagery of that. Um, and, you know, and absolutely vast. It's about twice the size of Australia. Uh, so anything you do down there just involves, you know, huge distances. Uh, and I suppose the best analogy, you know, to describe it is it, Alcatraz on steroids. It is pretty much it. It's the best way to describe Antarctica. Um, right, let me go forward. Uh, why, you know, and again, I always get asked, you know, why, you know, why have you always had this burning desire to go down to this place? you know, uh, and experience it. And for me, uh, as a young boy, I was about 12 years old, uh, never really heard of Antarctica, and I certainly hadn't heard of this guy, you know, Captain Scott. And I remember, you know, coming across this book uh, as a young lad and just flicking through it and just being massively inspired, you know, reading about this story, you know, of Captain Scott and his men, you know, just over 100 years ago, so not that long ago that actually, you know, mankind first reached the South Pole. Uh, and just been hugely inspired, you know, by these guys, you know, in their epic struggle to try and be the first uh, to get down to the uh, to the South Pole. Uh, and for those that are familiar with the uh, with the history, uh, will realise what happened with Scott after weeks and weeks of you know bitter struggle. They arrived at the South Pole to find this tent with a Norwegian flag flying on top, uh, and realise you know they'd been beaten, you know, in this epic race to be the first to get to the pole. Uh, and the Norwegian explorer Roald Amundsen had actually beaten them to it by, uh, by four weeks. Uh, and I think very much uh, this image, you know, sort of says it all. Uh, Captain Scott in the middle there and the rest of his guys, you know, stood at the pole. And you can very much see from the expression, you know, on their faces, you know, they're not, they don't look too happy by the fact, you know, that they've, they've arrived at the pole uh, when they realise they've been beaten. Uh, and there's a lot of thinking into the fact why, sadly, none of these guys, you know, made it back. Uh, they all perished on the 800-mile return journey trying to get back to their ship. Uh, and they think, you know, the reason is, you know, partly was down to the fact where their morale was so badly affected uh, by the fact that they realised, you know, they'd lost this race. Uh, and part of the story, you know, for me, that was hugely inspirational, uh, and probably part of the reason why I ended up joining the military, uh, was the story of Captain uh, Lawrence Oates, uh, and this painting that hangs in the Cavalry and Guards Club down in London depicts, you know, what happened. Um, and he got really bad frostbite in his feet on the return journey. Uh, and he felt that he was slowing Captain Scott and the rest of the guys down and jeopardising their chances of actually getting back to the ship safely. So one night, in the middle of a raging blizzard, uh, he turned to Scott and the rest of the, ties, uh, the guys in the tent and said, I'm just going outside, I may be some time. Uh, and he walked out of the tent, 
never to be seen again, uh, and essentially gave up his life, you know, for the benefit his, in, of his teammates in the hope that they could make better progress and make it back to the ship. Uh, but sadly, you know, that, that still wasn't enough. Uh, but I, again, I just remember reading about this, you know, as a young lad and just being hugely inspired, you know, by this, you know, pretty heroic act that this guy, you know, sort of, you know, carried out. Now, this is how you should do recruitment. <laughs> so, uh, very simple, you know, and, uh, and straight to the point. It's definitely how the British Army should go about recruitment. But, uh, anybody know who, uh, who might have written this? Anybody, anybody ever seen this before? Shackleton, absolutely, yeah. So, uh, Sir Ernest Shackleton. Uh, and again, I remember, like, as I was growing up, you know, I sort of discovered Shackleton and started reading about his you know, pretty heroic exploits, you know, down in Antarctica. Uh, and this was very much the inspiration uh, for the journey I've just done, because this was the first attempt to uh, traverse across Antarctica. Uh, sadly, didn't work out well for Shackleton. Uh, he went down in his ship. Uh, the Endurance, which you can see depicted in the picture here, uh, ship got caught in the ice uh, before they even made it to Antarctica. And over the course of several months, got crushed. Uh, and they had to abandon ship. Uh, and literally, they grabbed some uh, wooden lifeboats and loaded all the provisions and food they could manage and dragged these things across the ice. Uh, and they were into a bit of a, an epic survival mission. And eventually, they made it to a small rocky outcrop uh, on the edge of Antarctica called Elephant Island. They ran out of food. They're having to survive on seal meat, which is pretty grim, uh, I can assure you. Uh, and eventually, down to his supreme leadership, uh, he was able to organize a rescue from South Georgia uh, and all 28 of the guys survived it. And by the time they returned to the UK, they'd been missing for three years. So you can imagine the surprise, you know, with their families when they suddenly reappeared in civilization. Uh, but again, you know, still in the business world now, they're using examples, you know, of Shackleton's leadership, you know, to sort of, you know, very much sort of learn how, how to really motivate people. Uh, and again, hugely inspirational for me as a young guy. Uh, and then I joined the military. Um, and I joined it really young at 16. Uh, and after a few years, uh, I met this guy on the right-hand side, uh, Lieutenant Colonel Henry Worsley. And he very much gave me my first opportunity to go down to Antarctica uh, and experience it myself and have a go at skiing to the South Pole. Uh, and he came up with the concept to go down on the centenary, so exactly 100 years after the original journeys of Scott and Armiton, and recreate what happened and race to the South Pole. And the original plan was... Um, that a British team would go down uh, and we would do Captain Scott's route and we would race against a Norwegian team that would go and do Armadon's route. Uh, and we approached the Norwegian government and proposed it and they actually turned us down. And they said, nah, you know, we won 100 years ago, so why are we going to risk going back and, uh, and doing it again? <laughs> so, we're like, so we're like, okay, fine, we'll, we'll do the Norwegian route as well. So, uh, so we ended up with uh, myself and Henry. Uh, we went down to, uh, to start at Armandson's original start point on the edge of the continent, and we raced against three friends, uh, and they were going to start from Captain Scott's hut. And the start points were about 400 miles apart along the edge of the continent. And literally, we got dropped off, and we had a satellite phone link, and it was on the sat phone. It was on your marks, get set, go. And then we hung up, and then there was no communication between the two teams. And we raced for 800 miles over two months to the South Pole. Uh, and it's just one particular story I want to pull out from this trip, again, that left a huge impression on me. Uh, so this is me uh, up front, and uh, obviously Henry's taking this picture. It's just the two of us uh, doing the Norwegian route. Uh, we're about six weeks into the journey, and we've done about 500 miles so far across the Ross Ice Shelf. Uh, and we arrive here at the base of the Transantarctic Mountains, uh, and a point known as the Axel Heiberg Glacier, which Armand had gone up uh, about 100 years before us. Uh, and we arrived here, uh, and Henry, uh, the guy I was with, was a massive polar historian. Uh, and he was carrying an original copy of Armiton's diaries. Uh, and every day when we're out on this expedition, we'd finish skiing for 10, 11 hours, get into the tent, and uh, the last thing at night, uh, he would insist on opening the diary and reading out, you know, what Armiton had been doing 100 years before us and kind of relating it to where we were and how we were getting on. Uh, and at the time, I didn't fully appreciate it. You know, I would finish each day completely exhausted, collapse into the tent in a snotty heap, uh, and all I wanted to do was have my food, get into my sleeping bag, and just like prepare for the next day. Uh, and I'd get into the sleeping bag, and he would be reading out this portion of the diary, and I'd be lay there feigning interest and going, oh yeah, that's wonderful, Henry, thanks very much, uh, and just wanting to go to sleep. 
Um, but anyway, we arrived here, uh, and he's reading through the diary. Uh, and it talks about when Armisen arrived here 100 years before, um, he, he had a big dog team. Uh, and he was quite ruthless. Uh, he set out with 60 huskies, and every few weeks he was slaughtering the weaker dogs and feeding them to the stronger dogs, you know, to keep the team going, you know, and then he finished with 20 dogs, you know. And it was a deliberate plan. It was ruthless, but it worked, you know, and he got to the South Pole and back safely. And when he arrived here, 100 years before us, uh, he stopped off here and they called it the butcher's shop because uh, he slaughtered quite a few of the dogs and they buried him in the ice sheet at the base of the Axel Heiberg along with some other provisions and a spare tent and some other equipment to use on the return journey when they came back a few weeks later from the pole. And it also talked about he sent two guys out to a nearby rocky outcrop which he named Mount Betty and he told them to build a rock cairn. Does everybody know what a cairn is? Where you basically get some rocks and you just pile them up in like a natural man-made pyramid shape. Uh, and you can leave things inside a cairn to pick up later. And he told the guys, place inside a tin of cooker fuel and a tin of matches as an emergency reserve to, to use on the way back. But primarily, it was a marker beacon for this main depot down on the ice. And obviously, Henry had studied the return journey. And it, and it, and it talked about when they came back through several weeks later, they'd picked up the main depot down on the ice sheet, but there was no mention they'd gone back to this cairn. So when we arrived here, Henry's like, you know, that could still be there, you know, 100 years later if it hasn't been destroyed by weather, you know, or buried in snow. Uh, and when we got there, we, we'd had a particularly tough day. We'd been skiing for about 11 hours, put the tent up, and he's like, you know, do you fancy going out and to see if we can find this thing? And bearing in mind we had no coordinates, it was a loose description in the diary. And privately, I was like, nah. You know, I'm not up for it. And, uh, you know, and I could see how keen he was to go and find this thing. So we agreed a plan whereby he would go out on his own for a couple of hours uh, with some safety kit and a GPS and his jacket. Uh, and if he wasn't back after two hours, I, I would pack up the crevasse rescue kit, follow his ski tracks out. And if the worst had happened, hopefully I could rescue him. Uh, and I remember just laying in the tent and I watched him sort of ski off. And after about five minutes, you know, he disappeared off into a bit of a swirling blizzard, and I, and I couldn't see him anymore. Uh, and I remember the last thing his wife said to me before we left the UK was, whatever you do, don't let him go off and do anything stupid. Uh, <laughs> and this had stupid written all over it. But anyway, you know, he was a lieutenant colonel. I was a warrant officer at the time, so I was doing as I was told. Uh, anyway, he, he skis off, uh, and obviously he takes this next series of photographs. And uh, he starts gaining altitude at the side of the Axel Heiberg, uh, and the visibility improves and it clears. And he, and he spots this rocky outcrop, you know, loosely matching the description of Mount Betty uh, from the original diaries. And you can probably already see it on top there. There's a slightly unnatural, man-made looking sort of pimple pretty much in the middle of that sort of uh, rocky outline. So uh, he skis over, takes his skis off, and, and he scrambles up and gets on top of the rock. Uh, gets a bit closer, and there's this obvious man-made cairn uh, on the end of this rocky outcrop. So, uh, so he goes over. Uh, he does a quick selfie. Yeah, you've always got to do a selfie. And, uh, and he pulls a rock uh, from the side of this cairn and, uh, and looks inside. And sat inside is this rusted tin of cooker fuel with a tin of matches sat on top that's been sat there for 100 years. And it's the only thing left behind from that original journey uh, by the Norwegian Roald Armsen, you know, first man to the pole. Uh, and absolutely incredible. And because of his detailed study, you know, into these diaries, you know, he found this thing. Uh, GPS marked it, obviously tempted to nick it, but he didn't, and uh, <laughs> left it all exactly as it was. Uh, and we got back and reported it to the Norwegian government, and obviously for them now, you know, this is a national treasure. Uh, and as far as I'm aware, I don't think anybody's been back out there and seen this since. It's such a difficult and expensive place to get to. Uh, and I can just remember, by the time he got back to the tent, four hours had elapsed. Uh, and it was well overdue, and I'd packed up all the kit, and literally, I was clipping on my skis uh, and about to head out on his ski tracks, like heart in my mouth, you know, expecting the worst. I just remember seeing this black shape, you know, coming out of the mist, and his arms were waving, and he was shouting, and I couldn't hear anything. And the first thing I heard when he got within earshot was, I fucking found it! <laughs> like, you know, and, uh, you know, absolutely incredible. I obviously got into the tent, you know, showed me all the imagery, and you know, just, yeah, amazing, like, you know. And I learned a valuable lesson then about, you know, sort of mental endurance and... You know, going that little bit further and obviously missed out on a huge opportunity. Uh, we continued on, uh, and the climb up the Axel Heiberg, you know, was actually quite technical. Uh, and you can just make out our ski tracks in amongst this maze of crevassing, 
uh, as we're working our way up. Uh, and we stopped off, and some of these crevasses, you, you could throw this marquee into it, you know, and they would disappear. Um, absolutely vast. Um, and it's actually me, uh, we, we decided to stop off and, and get a picture of one of these things so we get a sense of scale. Uh, and I remember he was stood down there with a the camera, and he asked me to ski round. He goes, I'll oh, just go up the top of the crevasse, and, uh, and we'll get a picture. And it wasn't until I came down and saw the photograph afterwards, I realized I was still on a massive overhang. And I was like, Henry, that was a little bit sketchy. And uh, <laughs> he was like, he was like, nah, nah, you're absolutely fine. It's thick, like, you know, it's not, not going to give way, like, you know. But uh, yeah, you know, pre pretty, uh, pretty hairy stuff. Uh, I talked about really low temperatures. I, I took this picture at minus 45 uh, without wind chills. Sort of took down my hood and goggles briefly uh, to get this shot. And it was about an hour later, I was pouring some uh, water from my flask uh, into a cup and the wind caught it uh, and soaked the, uh, the tips of the fingers of my glove. Uh, and before I could react, I got a little bit of a frost nip uh, in the tips of my fingers and actually sort of half of my thumb. Um, you know, and it happened in a sort of fraction of a second from a tiny mistake. Uh, and again, learned a sort of valuable lesson, but I was able to sort of dress it. Uh, we had about four weeks to go to reach the South Pole and actually prevented it from getting any worse. Uh, I made a full recovery and I didn't lose any, uh, any of my digits at all. Uh, Henry was slightly less fortunate. Uh, you can see what happened with Henry. Uh, he snapped his tooth off on a piece of frozen Mars bar. Uh, you know, so uh, so you, you have this grazing bag as you're skiing along and it's got chocolate, nuts and broken up energy bars in there. Uh, and obviously it's rock hard where it's deep frozen. Uh, and he made the schoolboy error of rather than pack it into his cheeks and leave it in there for about 30 seconds, you know, soften it up and, and then start to chew on it. Uh, he popped in this bit of frozen Mars bar, bit into it you know, straight away and, uh, and snapped his tooth off. Uh, and he did it quite early on in the day. And obviously all the nerve endings were exposed to the super cooled air that he was then breathing in. I, I don't know why he's smiling in this picture because he wasn't very happy. Uh, and obviously I'm not a dentist by any stretch of the imagination, but... Uh, we had some DIY kit in quite an extensive medical pack. Uh, and I was able to sort of pack some sealant in there and just make him a little bit more comfortable uh, for the remainder of the journey. Uh, and for this trip, finally, after 67 days, uh, we made it into the, uh, the geographic South Pole. Uh, and the first thing we asked is obviously, you know, a large scientific American base there uh, at the pole. And the first thing we asked, you know, are the Scott team here? Uh, and we'd beaten them in. And we ended up waiting nine days uh, before the guys came in. So we kind of... You know, repeated history, if you like. Uh, and the biggest mistake probably we made on this journey, and what I learned a huge amount about what was nutrition, um, and the, probably the one thing we weren't very scientific about uh, was looking at how many calories we were going to be eating per day and the balance of fats, carbs, you know, and, and proteins. Uh, and this is what happened. So before I started the expedition, um, I looked like this. I don't know why I've got a slightly psychotic look on my face. I think... <laughs> I think I was terrified I was about to go to Antarctica for the first time. But, um, you know, I weighed a sort of, you know, healthy 85 kilograms, you know, before I start. Uh, and then when I arrived at the South Pole, I looked like this. So I, I was down to 2% body fat. Uh, I'd lost, like, everything. Yeah, and we were both the same. Uh, and, and it made the journey unnecessarily difficult physically. Obviously, we're feeling the cold, you know, quite a lot as well. So, so uh, a huge amount of learning, you know, from that, that first expedition... Uh, which then you know, prepared me really well to then go on to the, uh, the future trips uh, that I went on to do after that. Uh, very sadly, um, Henry lost his life uh, just over three years ago. Uh, he went down to Antarctica to attempt to be the first person in history to ski solo uh, and unsupported, uh, which essentially means you're not using kites, any kind of wind, assistant, wind assistance, uh, and you're not taking any form of resupply. So you get dropped on the edge of the continent, uh, with everything you need to survive, you know, so all of your food, about 75 days of food, tent, sleeping bag, and you try and ski, you know, right the way across the continent. He was attempting to do a thousand mile journey, uh, and he almost did it. Um, he got 900 miles across, uh, and sadly, with about 100 miles to go, he succumbed to a medical condition. Um, so this was very much part of the sort of motivation to go down uh, and attempt this journey as a, a tribute, you know, to a very good friend. Uh, in between, I, I led a team of very young soldiers, a team of army reservists, uh, all lads in their 20s. Uh, some of them had never put a set of skis on their feet before. And over the course of two years of build-up and training and going out to Norway and Iceland, uh, I got them to a point where they were able to go down uh, and attempt a long-range crossing uh, of the continent. Uh, these are the guys here. This was uh, 2016. We got dropped on the edge of the continent. 
uh, and we set off to go 1,100 miles right the way across, but with a resupply at the South Pole. Um, so this was a, uh, a supported journey. Uh, this is the guys having uh, got into the South Pole. Uh, and then we continued on, and we reached uh, Henry's final campsite, uh, 100 miles from the finish. And we stopped there, and we did a memorial service you know, on behalf of Henry. And from that point onwards, it was all about finishing off his journey you know, and completing that 100 miles that he wasn't able to do. Uh, and it was quite technical. The, the final phase, we went into a, uh, what's called the Shackleton Glacier, which no one had ever gone down before. Um, and it got quite technical with the ice. There was a lot of disturbed ice and crevassing uh, when we got in there. And it was a switch from being on skis, and we'd done 1,000 miles on skis, uh, and suddenly we're on blue ice and having to walk on crampons uh, and going to back, to back to a normal walking motion rather than a skiing motion. Uh, and we all started getting blisters again and sort of aches and pains, uh, and it was pretty challenging. And you can see the crevassing here, you know, and we were regularly falling into crevasses, you know, sort of five, you know, ten times a day uh, into these things, you know, and having to get the polks out and extract guys out, you know, that had gone down. And then right at the end, uh, after 67 days again, so same as the original journey I did with Henry, uh, we made it down onto the Ross Ice Shelf uh, on the far side of the continent. And when we, uh, when we finished the journey, we got picked up, uh, and you don't leave Antarctica straight away, you go back to a temporary holding base called Union Glacier. Uh, and when the plane landed, uh, this guy came over and said, hey guys, amazing job, you know, I appreciate you've just skied 1,000 miles across the continent. Uh, and he jokingly said, I'm the organizer of the Antarctic Ice Marathon. Uh, and pure coincidence, it's happening tomorrow. And if you want free entry in the race and you want to go and run a marathon, you're more than welcome. Uh, I laughed in his face. Uh, I was like, no, no thanks. The other five team members were like, yeah, that's, that, that sounds pretty good, like, you know. Uh, and, and they went out and begged, borrowed, and stole running kit, bearing in mind we didn't have anything, and they hadn't had a shower for like 60-odd days at this point. And uh, they grabbed some kit, and f the five guys went out the following day and ran a marathon. Uh, in Antarctica, so I think testament to the, uh, the nutrition this time around was a whole lot better. Uh, I think there's a short video clip uh, that summarizes uh, that expedition with the team. just to finish off, finally, uh, I went down in uh, November last year, uh, so I've only been back a few months on this trip, uh, to go down 
uh, and, and really do the journey in the sort of style that Henry intended, um, to do it solo uh, and unsupported, so with no form of resupply. Uh, so beginning of November last year, uh, I got dropped on the edge of the continent uh, with 75 days of food. Uh, the pulk that I was hauling behind me uh, weighed about 130 kilograms, uh, and I went down to try and do 1,000 miles uh, and get across the, uh, to the far side uh, of Antarctica. Uh, and this is how I went about it. Uh, Training-wise, it actually took me uh, 18 months you know, uh, to train for this trip. I, I'm by no stretch of the imagination any kind of athlete uh, or, or endurance machine, all, all sort of various labels that have been applied to me you know, by the media. Uh, I definitely have to work at my fitness you know, as much as anybody else. Uh, and I really believe you know, anyone you know, with the right sort of determination you know, and knowledge and preparation you know, can, can build themselves up you know, to go and attempt these journeys. Uh, the best way to prepare you know, for hauling you know, a heavy poke you know, across the ice uh, when you haven't got access to snow and ice you know, back in the UK uh, is actually go out dragging a tyre. Um, so I'd finish my day's work with the army and in the evenings I'd go out with this tyre. I'd go out with the dog you know, uh, close to where I live uh, and haul this tyre around for two or three hours. And I'd go past loads of other dog walkers that just look at me like I'm some complete <laughs> lunatic. Uh, and it's not till you, you stop and explain to them, you know, what, what it is you're doing and what you're sort of preparing for. Uh, and I've heard all the gags like, you know, oh, it looks a bit tiring, mate, you know, or uh, you know, I, I bet that's a bit of a drag, uh, you know, and all the rest of it. But, uh, you know, you find once you chat to people and explain, you know, then actually they will start following on sort of social media. Uh, and it really sort of builds up from there. And I think by, before I went, there was about 250,000 people on Instagram, Facebook, you know, we started following the sort of build up and, and preparation uh, for the journey. Uh, without a doubt, you know, the hardest element you know, of going unsupported and solo is, is the sheer weight uh, of what you've got to haul behind you. Uh, and when I first did a sort of test load of the Polk a few months out, uh, it was 165 kilograms. Uh, and, and I couldn't move it. It was just too heavy uh, with the 75 days of food. So it was like back to the drawing board and just looking at every single item that I had in there. Uh, and where could I sort of save weight? Uh, and in the end, I managed to get 24 hours of food uh, down to one kilogram. Um, I was literally sawing the handle off my toothbrush to save a few grams, cutting all the labels out of clothing. Uh, and when I tell, tell the school kids this, you know, they all think it's pretty gross. Uh, but in the end, I did the whole journey in one set of underwear, one pair of socks, one thermal base layer. Uh, so by the time I got back to the hotel in Chile, at the end of the expedition. I hadn't had a shower or changed any of my clothes for 83 days, uh, which was pretty gross. Uh, and I can remember like, being stood in the hotel reception waiting to check in. Uh, and there was actually an American family in front of me. Uh, and there's a little girl with them. She was about five or six years old. And obviously, I was heating up nicely in the hotel lobby. And uh, I can remember like, looking around at me like wild-eyed and staring. Obviously, I had a big beard and stinking to high heaven. And I remember pulling a mum's sleeve and going, Mummy, Mummy, that man really smells. <laughs> and, uh, and the whole family looking around and going, Whoa, you know, where have you come from? So, uh, but, you know, it's what I had to do uh, to make it manageable, you know, to be able to, uh, to do this journey. Uh, the food wise, I was eating 6,000 calories a day. Uh, and if you think an adult, you know, in this environment typically eats between two, two and a half thousand. Um, but I was burning 10,000, so I was still going to be losing weight. Uh, but it was a fine balance between, you know, do I take 10,000 calories, but then the weight is heavier, you know, and I'm working harder to move that weight. So we decided in the end, you know, working with specialists, nutritionists, uh, et cetera, that 6,000 was about right, you know, to fuel myself sufficiently uh, to be able to complete the crossing, but, you know, keeping the weight down as well. Uh, and then finally, with all the sort of build-up, preparation and training done, uh, beginning of November last year, uh, flew from southern Chile uh, uh, and they charter this uh, Illusion aircraft that comes across from Kazakhstan. Uh, and you get on board the, uh, a crazy Russian crew. Uh, you walk on board the aircraft and it all kind of stinks of vodka, which is a little bit disconcerting, but hey, uh, I'm sure they know what they're doing. Uh, and it literally lands on sheet ice, uh, you know, when you, uh, when you get into Antarctica, which again is pretty, uh, pretty scary. Uh, you spend a few days in this uh, temporary holding base called Union Glacier. Uh, doing sort of final kit prep and, and waiting for a sort of weather window to, to get out to your chosen start point uh, on the edge of the continent. Uh, and once you're ready to go, they bring in this small twin otter ski plane, uh, and that then flies you out to the edge of the continent uh, to begin your journey. And this was, uh, this was day one, uh, and I got dropped off just over the horizon. You can just sort of make out my ski tracks there. Uh, and the first day was exceptionally you know, difficult and quite daunting. 
Uh, and I remember sort of getting off the plane, and it was a female pilot, um, Canadian ice pilot, that they came down to, uh, to drop me off. Uh, and we, it took us about 20 minutes to try and get this polk off the aircraft and manhandle it down, get it onto the ice, and we literally thought it was going to snap in half. Uh, and I remember the last thing she said to me, uh, you know, she's about to get back into a plane and fly off, and she just looked at me, and she goes, I feel so sorry for you right now. And she goes, I'm going to get in my plane and fly off. I'm going to leave you on your own. You're going to try and drag that thing for 1,000 miles. She goes, you're completely insane. And I had a bit of a wobble, uh, I must admit. And I almost got back on the plane and thought, yeah, this is probably a really bad idea. Uh, but eventually, you know, off she goes and, uh, you know, and, and I sort of get stuck into the journey. Uh, this is my first campsite, um, you know, a little one-man tent. Um, great, you know, that there's, uh, you know, 24-hour daylight so all the way through November, December, January. The sun never goes down in Antarctica. Um, so I was able to recharge uh, my iPhone that I was carrying, obviously no phone signal. Uh, but I had about 5,000 songs on there, about 50 audio books, which were brilliant for just keeping my mind occupied during the 11, 12 hours that I was skiing each day. Uh, and I was able to, again, recharge my GPS and, and the sat phone and the safety beacon uh, that I was carrying off that. Didn't carry any water, so I'm melting snow. So in the vestibule of the tent, um, I have a cooker, uh, and I was using that to rehydrate my food and make all my drinks um, throughout the whole of the journey. Uh, has anybody heard of sastrugi before? Uh, this stuff is like the bane of polar travelers' lives. Uh, everyone thinks Antarctica's flat, uh, and it's far from it. Um, through the winter season, you get these catabatic winds that rip up the surface of the continent and call, cause these rock-hard ridges of uh, ice. And in, in places, they can be inches high uh, and can make you know, sort of progress really tricky. Uh, and in other places, you know, it can be towering above your head, you know, sort of seven, eight feet high. Uh, and the polk will be you know, tipping over, getting caught, your skis are bending and flexing, and you're kind of stumbling around. Uh, you know, and it's really difficult to navigate your way through this stuff. Uh, and you get sastrugi, uh, and then you get this. Uh, and this is actually a photograph. Uh, and I'm stood there with the iPhone looking forward, you know, the terrain I'm about to ski over, uh, and it's white out. Uh, and this is where a cloud comes in and completely obscures the sun uh, and causes this flat-like condition. And essentially, it's like being inside a ping-pong ball. Um, you may as well be blindfolded, so you can imagine trying to ski over Sastrugi uh, and then in white out as well. You know, and there was days where I'd be skiing for 11 hours and I'd manage about two and a half, three miles you know, on, on these sort of really difficult days. Uh, and you literally you look down and all you can see is your compass mounted on your chest on a frame uh, and the tips of your skis, and that's the only thing you've got to get any kind of perspective. Uh, you know, and to be staring at a compass for 11 hours, it's, it's just really mentally fatiguing you know, and takes quite a while to get used to. Uh, I took this shot, uh, this was about minus 53, uh, and I knew it was really cold this day. Uh, I stopped to go for a wee, uh, and I noticed my urine was actually turning to ice crystals before it hit the ground, uh, and was like blowing away in the wind. And I was like, okay, yeah, that's, uh, that, that's pretty chilly. <laughs> and then uh, and finally, on this journey, after 41 days, uh, made it into the South Pole, uh, just over halfway. And uh, when I got in, there's obviously a large uh, American scientific base there uh, doing some valuable scientific study uh, into climate change and also looking at neutrinos uh, and lots of other great stuff. Uh, and they all came out of the base um, to obviously see who this lunatic was skiing around outside on his own. Uh, and they offered me you know, to go in for a guided tour of the base. You know, they want to go for a hot meal, I could grab a shower. Uh, and I had to turn it all down uh, because I was doing the journey unsupported. Uh, I couldn't receive any form of assistance. I couldn't drop anything off, uh, even though the temptation was absolutely massive, uh, as you can imagine. Uh, and you can see the base you know, uh, in the background here. And it's like something out of James Bond. You know, it's a really impressive facility. Uh, sits on hydraulic legs. Uh, and every season, they jack this thing up you know, to keep it above the snow line to stop it getting buried. Uh, but literally, I stayed for about an hour uh, and just had to get away from there and, and get into the, uh, the second phase of the journey. Uh, and for the final leg, um, I was up on the Polar Plateau, about 10,500 feet. Um, some incredible scenery. You just see things that you wouldn't see anywhere else on the planet. You know, these huge sort of parhelions, you know, around the sun, uh, triggered by uh, frozen ice crystals in the atmosphere. You know, it really is, uh, you know, pretty stunning up there. Uh, right towards the end, I'm about 800 miles into the journey. And uh, it's starting to take a bit of wear and tear, you know, and a bit of damage on the body. Uh, things are starting to break down and, and kit failures. Um, this particular shot, um, I was skiing along. It was a really strong headwind. Uh, I had my hood up, my goggles on, a face mask, you know, everything covered. Uh, and the face mask just moved a tiny bit as I was skiing along. 
uh, and exposed a bit of skin. Uh, and within about 10 seconds, I felt a real burning sensation down the side of my face. I uh, got in the tent that night and checked, and I had frost nip all down the side of my face, you know, just literally a few seconds of, uh, of exposure. Uh, but again, was able to cover it up and you know, sort of prevent it, you know, getting any worse. Uh, this next shot's a little bit more gruesome. Uh, so this is the inside of my right knee. Uh, it started as an abrasion injury um, from the constant rubbing, and then the cold got into it. Uh, and over the course of one day, by the time I got into the tent that night uh, and checked it, it had gone from a couple of red spots uh, to this quite open wound. Uh, but again, I was able to pack it with some steroid cream, seal it up, you know, uh, and sort of prevent it getting any worse for the, uh, the final phases of the journey. And then right at the end, finally, you know, I was into the Transantarctic Mountains. And this was the first time I actually had something on the horizon uh, to ski towards. Yeah, and it was great, you know, for the first time I got a sense of progress, you know, I could see my horizon filling. Uh, I knew it was very much into the, uh, into the home run. And right at the end, uh, you know, I so did this journey the wrong way around. I, I went uphill for nearly 900 miles uh, and had a downhill run of about 60 miles right at the end. Uh, but it was all to do with the prevailing winds, you know, and it worked out sort of best through it that way around. Uh, and you can't see it in here, but actually some of the, some of the sections at the end were quite steep. Uh, and for the first time, I was actually sliding on the skis. Uh, but I had a couple of comedy moments where the polk accelerated up behind me, smacked me in the back of the legs, and I fell backwards into it. And a pair of us would career off completely out of control downhill. But it was great. I would go half a mile in about a minute, but then have a spectacular wipeout at the bottom with like kits spread everywhere. But it was, uh, it was great progress, though. And then uh, finally, after 56 days, pretty much completely on my own, uh, bar the brief encounter with the, uh, the US guys at the South Pole. Uh, I made it down off the continent uh, onto the Ross Ice Shelf. Uh, and when I arrived, uh, I'd actually been racing against a, uh, an American uh, guy called uh, Colin O'Brady, uh, an endurance athlete. Uh, and we'd set out on this journey at the same time to try and do the same thing by pure coincidence. Uh, and when I arrived, uh, he'd actually beaten me in by two days. Goddamn Americans, like, you know, so... Uh, Beat me, uh, beat me to it. But uh, I was the first Brit, you know, to, uh, to get in and the second person in the world. So uh, still quite happy, uh, happy with that. Uh, and when me, me and Colin arrived, uh, we had nothing left uh, food-wise. We'd pretty much scoffed a lot because the, uh, the plan was uh, the plane was going to come in that day and, and scoop us up. Um, so we got in. Uh, we called them up and said, hey, guys, you know, we're here. We're ready for pickup. Uh, and they were like, bad news, guys. The, uh, the weather's not great over our side of the continent. It's going to be three days before we can get to you. Uh, and we thought we were going to be eating snow for three days, which would be pretty rubbish. Uh, and luckily, we spoke to the pilots. Uh, and they'd been out the year before uh, in preparation for this journey and dropped off these, uh, these fuel drums so they could resupply the aircraft with fuel because uh, it was a 12-hour round flight to get to us. Uh, and the pilots had dug in a cool box of food underneath the third barrel along. And it had been buried in the ice for a year. Uh, so me and Colin digging like madmen. Uh, you know, dug this thing out, it's about four feet down, uh, and inside were like French cheeses and like ham and coffee and chocolate and things we just hadn't had for two months. And we were like two giggling schoolboys, like, you know, feasting on this stuff. Uh, and, and it was enough to last the, uh, the three days uh, before they came over. Uh, did a quick, uh, quick body shot, uh, and Colin took this picture uh, just to have a look at how much weight I'd lost this time around. Uh, I'd lost 15 kg. Um, but felt absolutely fine for it. And as you can see, nowhere near as drastic uh, as the first trip with, uh, with Henry. And then finally, after the, uh, the three days, uh, they got the ski plane across and they were able to, uh, to scoop us up. Uh, and they very kindly bought us this bottle of champagne. Uh, and bearing in mind, we hadn't drank alcohol for probably about two and a half months at this point. Uh, I remember we got into the back of the plane and it was unpressurized and we were flying at 14,000 feet over the top of the Transantarctic Mountains. Uh, and me and Colin were sat down the back end, wedging amongst these field drums with a couple of paper cups, uh, drinking this bottle of champagne. And by the time we landed at Union Glacier at the far end, we literally fell out the side of the plane. Uh, it had a, a huge effect on us, but, uh, but great fun. Uh, and I went from you know, pretty much two months on my own and not really having a proper conversation with anyone uh, to returning to the UK you know, to quite, you know, quite a sort of media storm uh, and a huge amount of interest you know, in what we'd done. Uh, and it was quite surreal from going that, you know, from that complete isolation uh, to suddenly being surrounded by masses of people and bombarded with questions, but it was, it was great fun as well. Uh, okay, so just to wrap it up, you know, sort of during my time in the military, been really fortunate to go on you know, three amazing uh, expeditions uh, down to Antarctica. 
Uh, and something that, you know, somebody else pointed out to me, which I never really clocked, and when I finished the trip, I'd just turned 50. Um, you know, and there's definitely a perception, you know, within the British military, and I think militaries around the world, that once you kind of get to 40 years old, that you're probably sort of past your sort of active duty time and, you know, physically limited where you can be employed. And hopefully, you know, me going down at, you know, sort of 50 years old and doing quite an extreme journey is sort of challenging that perception. Uh, and I really think now with the sort of improvements and knowledge, you know, and people are training much smarter and improvements in nutrition, we're all eating better, uh, you can really extend your sort of physical performance, you know, in, into much later life. Uh, brilliant. That, uh, that concludes my talks, ladies and gentlemen. I think we've got a few minutes for, uh, for any Q&A. Great. So, uh, yeah, please feel free, uh, you know, anything I've covered at all, uh, you know, uh, ask away. Yes. <laughs> okay, yeah, it didn't take long, did it? Uh, how do you go to the toilet? Yeah, so uh, I didn't carry. I decided in the end, again, and it was a weight-saving thing, and also I didn't want to actually leave loads of sort of, you know, toilet paper across the continent uh, and stuff. So, uh, so the, way, the way I'd go about it, to try and go during the day, you know, is epic when you've got like six layers of clothing on. Uh, you know, you just don't want to entertain that thought. So I'd go first thing in the morning uh, while the tent was still up. Uh, I'd dash outside uh, in my thermals um, with my carbon fiber shovel. I had this little shovel, uh, affectionately known as Doug. So, uh, so me and Doug would dash outside, dig a hole in the snow, uh, and then the, uh, I'd go to the toilet, and then the chunks of snow that I'd dug out from the hole, I'd fashion those into pebble size, and I'd use those instead of toilet paper, which was quite bracing, uh, as you can imagine, like, you know. <laughs> And it took a bit of getting used to, but it was effective. And, uh, and all that would go back into the hole, and I'd fill it in. And that way, then, I wasn't leaving any sort of rubbish behind. So, uh, yeah, so that's how I went about, you know, going to the, uh, going to the toilet. So uh, quite challenging, you know, getting your undercarriage out at minus 45. But, you know, I, I got used to it. Uh, and I got super quick at it as well. So, uh, sorry, yeah. What's next? What's the next challenge that can top this? Uh, yeah, what next? Um, if, if my wife finds out that I'm thinking about anything else, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm in big trouble. But um, what, what I'm thinking about, um, and, and this would be a couple of years' time, uh, so obviously where I, where I ski to and where everybody skis to is the geographic um, South Pole, uh, which represents you know, the, the bottom dead centre of the planet. Um, but it's not actually the centre of Antarctica. Um, so if you look at Antarctica on its own as a continent... The actual heart of Antarctica uh, is about 450 miles deeper in from the geographic South Pole. Uh, and it's called, the, uh, it's called the South Pole of inaccessibility uh, for a reason. Um, you know, it's notorious you know, for, uh, for being particularly windswept, desolate, you know, extreme low temperatures. It's high on the polar plateau. It's regularly in the minus 40s uh, all the time. Uh, and nobody has ever skied um, to the South Pole of inaccessibility. So it's been visited. Uh, people have flown out there. Uh, people have kited through the Pole of inaccessibility, but no one's managed to ski to it. Uh, and the cool thing about it is there's actually something there. Uh, so in reaction to the Americans uh, building their base at the geographic South Pole, the Russians went out to the South Pole of inaccessibility, uh, and they actually built a wooden hut uh, there, and, and they threw in about 10 scientists, you know, as the Russians do on a bit of a budget, a uh, <laughs> couple of support staff, and they were like, right, you know, stag on here and claim this for Russia. Uh, and it was a bit of a disaster. Uh, they lasted about six weeks, uh, realized they just couldn't sustain it. Um, you know, the cost and the difficulty of getting to this place uh, was obviously, you know, extremely difficult. So they went out, you know, six weeks later, picked up all the staff, uh, but they left behind the wooden hut. Uh, and on the side of the wooden hut, there was a wooden chimney stack. On top of the chimney stack, there's a gold bust of Lenin orientated towards Moscow. And over the last 50, 60 years, the hut's been completely buried, but the only thing sticking out above the snow line is this gold bust of Lenin. So my plan is to ski there and steal it. And, uh, <laughs> and, and uh, I'll probably get poisoned in Salisbury a few weeks later, but hey, it'll be, uh, it, it'll, it'll be, it'll be totally worth it. You know, so, uh, so, so it could be back here in a couple of years' time with a gold bust of Lenin, like, you know. I think it's actually made of plastic, you know, but yeah. So, uh, yeah, so that's, that's an idea, you know, maybe have a go at the South Pole of inaccessibility. So, um, yeah. Once you've started, right, there's sort of nowhere to go but forward. Yeah. Your, your psyche dictates whether that's a miserable experience or a good one. How do you keep yourself sort of positive thinking as you go from, you know, mile five to mile 
Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, so I guess like mental sort of coping strategies. Um, yeah, so, so things I did, you know, that kind of worked for me. Um, I, I broke the whole journey down into 10-day blocks. Because um, I think I just found the whole thing, you know, sort of quite overwhelming if I thought about a thousand miles and, and two months. Um, so what I did, you know, and, and the reason I went for 10 day blocks, uh, my, my food was packaged into 10 day bags. Uh, and at the bottom of each 10 day bag, I had a chocolate dessert, uh, you know, as a treat. Uh, so when I got dropped off, all I thought about was the first 10 days. I didn't even think beyond that. Um, and all I thought about, right, get to day 10 and you get the chocolate pud. Uh, and, and then I get to roll up a food bag, and I know then actually I'm 13 kilograms lighter, because I knew exactly what a 10-day food bag weighed, you know, with the extra bits in there, it was 13 kg. Uh, so I did that, so literally I got to day 10, got to this chocolate pudding, and I was like, right, okay, now just think about the next 10 days. Um, so I, I kind of broke it down into bite-sized chunks, which mentally made it more manageable. Um, you know, and I think, right, just get to day 20, then you can give up. You know, and I'll get there, I think, right, okay, just do another 10, and then you can give up. You know? So that, that worked. Um, I think other things that really helped, I guess, even though on the solo one, physically I was on my own, uh, mentally I knew there was a huge following out there, you know, with, with uh, lots of, you know, friends, family, supporters, you know, following the trip and sort of wishing me on. Um, and before I set off, um, Henry's wife, Joanna, um, she came to me and she gave me um, Henry's family crest flag uh, that he'd been carrying on that solo trip. And she kind of handed it to me and said, like, you know, this time, you know, try and get the flag right the way across and sort of finish this off. Uh, that was a huge motivator, you know. So it kind of gave it a deeper purpose as to why I was there, uh, having a go at this trip. Uh, and other things that really helped, audio books. You know, I, I got quite sick of the music, you know, listening to music as a scheme, but audio books were fantastic. Uh, you know, and just listening to these things. And I, a lot of the time, I might not be particularly listening to what was being said, but just having a human voice... Uh, in the headphones as I was skiing along, I found that really comforting, and I'd, I'd kind of pretend there was somebody alongside me as I was skiing along. Uh, and if anybody was watching externally, they probably thought I was going barking mad, but I used to chat to my shadow as well uh, as I was skiing along. I named my shadow and I had conversations with that, you know, as I was skiing. So, so I think it was a whole range, you know, of different things. And I was raising money for charity as well. So, uh, so some days when I was feeling a bit sorry for myself, you know, I'd kind of remind myself that hey, you're raising money for you know people have had life-changing injuries. You know, lost limbs in Afghanistan. So you know, you know, sort of you know, man up, Rudd, and uh, just get on with it. You know, because you know you're suffering, but it's temporary. You know, compared to lifelong challenges that other people have got. So, so I think all those things, you know, all kind of helped, and I'll, I'll, I'll draw on those at different times during the journey to, you know, to keep myself motivated. So, so yeah, that's just kind of what worked for me. Yeah, so, cool. Any uh, any final ones? Yes. Yeah. And you look like you're in a very small pair of Vikings pants. <laughs> yes. Let's get those online. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so you're quite interested in my underwear, is that what you're saying? So, uh, so that, that pair of pants that I had on for 83 days, I've actually bought them along this evening, and uh, you know, I was going to uh, going to pass them. <laughs> yeah. They were actually uh, specially made in Norway, uh, and uh, there's actually a recognised condition called polar penis. Uh, which I have suffered from in the past, and it's where you get a really strong headwind because um, you don't tend to generate that much heat down in that area. It can actually get really uncomfortable. Uh, so I actually had this specialist you know, pair of boxer shorts made. I had a mesh in that has actually a windproof shield uh, on the front, and they were absolutely brilliant, to be honest. They, uh, they were, uh, <laughs> size extra large. Yeah, so. <laughs> There's always one heckler, isn't there? Like, so, uh, yes. It's all right, just shout it, I can hear you. You carried a sat phone, and I'm just worrying, wondering if you did have like some issue on your journey, like you had a condition around any time, like something yeah. happens with the phone, how comfortable were you with a sat phone when you get a call to pay and you have to come to a rescue? Um, yeah, so the uh, logistics support company that, that flew me in at the beginning and then sort of picked me up at the end, an uh, American firm called uh, Antarctic Logistics Expeditions, uh, massively experienced, you know, capable gang, have been sort of doing this for for 25 years. Um, so yeah, so I did have, you know, I carried a, a tracking beacon, obviously had the satellite phone. Uh, but the understanding was, obviously, because of weather conditions, you know, um, they're limited, um, you know, with the aircraft and when they can fly. So, um, so you know, the sort of quote was anything between one to sort of five days, uh, depending on weather conditions, depending where I was on the journey, 
You know, uh, you know, if I was right the far side of the continent, obviously, you know, they need good weather systems all the way through that sort of you know six to eight hour flight to get to me. So, um, so I carried a really comprehensive medical pack uh, with antibiotics. I had you know uh, morphine injectors in there, uh, all that kind of stuff. So if I had you know fallen and broken a limb, which I nearly did, um, I had quite a bad fall off a, a big lump of sastrugi. I fell about eight feet in whiteout, uh, and then the polk landed on top of me. Uh, I actually thought I'd broken my back. Uh, I actually snapped my ski in half when a crash landed as well, so, which was pretty scary. Uh, but luckily, just a bit battered and bruised, uh, I was able to carry on. But yeah, you know, the understanding is that you know, if you're in a difficult spot in amongst the Strugi and it's bad weather, you know, it's, it's potentially going to be days uh, before they sort of get to you. Uh, you know, and I guess that's just a sort of risk element you know, of sort of doing these journeys. Um, but there is that sort of you know, support cover there uh, if you have a genuine emergency. So uh, yeah. Yeah, I'm wondering what the re-entry is like for you after a couple of months out. Like one day you're, you know, in, in a sort of life-defying cold, the next day you're in a hotel bed or at home. What's that transition like to come back from that? Yeah, uh, and definitely the transition from, you know, quite extreme hardship in Antarctica to being here in Sal Salito, you know, and staying in a really nice hotel and eating great food is, is quite surreal as well, uh, even though I've been back a few months. But uh I think, you know, it was when I first finished, you know, sort of coming back and you almost get a phase of post-expedition blues um, because you spent two years, you know, sort of driving towards this goal and target and every waking moment, you know, the, all you're thinking about is the expedition, how do I raise the money, you're making sure you're physically preparing, mentally preparing and everything else that's involved in it. So it all becomes, you know, completely, totally consuming for two years. And you find you go and do the trip and when you finish and you come back, all of a sudden, you know, you feel like you've lost a child almost to where there's got this sort of, you know, big gap in your life. And then suddenly you're back to the normal day job, you know, and sort of routine of life. And that, that does take definitely take a, you know, a bit of getting used to. And um, I think what helped me personally was um, I, I guess I'd gone through that kind of transition phase um, quite a lot during my time in the military uh, with multiple tours in Iraq and Afghanistan, uh, having been away for sort of six months tours of duty and sort of being out on operations and then sort of coming back, you know, to family and a normal routine, having gone through that, you know, and, the fam and more importantly, my family, I'm married with three children, and them having gone through that process several times because of military tours, I think helped, you know, with that transition of coming back from Antarctica, you know, but still, yeah, it, it is still difficult and it does take a bit of time to, you know, to, uh, to adjust, so, particularly from a solo journey, you know, which I've never done before, so. Cool, how are we doing there? Yeah. Yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, um, I spent a lot of time, you know, reading sort of polar history. And it, yeah, absolutely looking at those original journeys, you know, of Scott Armisen, Shackleton, you know, the polar pioneers. And uh, yeah, you can definitely learn a huge amount. And, uh, and it just gives you even more respect, to be honest, you know, when you look at what they had, you know, and the sort of what they were eating and, and everything else and, and how they managed to do, to do those journeys, you know, over 100 years ago with, with the technology that they had back then. Uh, just you know, make you know, once you've been down there yourself with modern gear, it, it gives you an even deeper appreciation for you know the hardships you know those guys must have gone through. Uh, and people often ask, oh, it must be so much easier now, you know, with sort of modern kit and lightweight and better nutrition, and you train much smarter. Uh, and I think to a degree that's true, but what it also means is you just push the boundaries more, though. Um, you know, back you know 100 years ago, Scott or Shackleton couldn't have even dreamed of trying to go solo and unsupported, you know, right the way across with what they had. Uh, and I think all it means, I think we are still actually, you know, to a similar degree, you know, sort of, you know, suffering, you know, as much as they did in the fact that we're just pushing things much further now, you know, and sort of seeing how far we can go and what we, you know, what we can get away with down there, you know, by, by sort of pushing the limits. So I think in some respects, even though we've got modern gear, that there is definitely comparisons to be drawn you know, from what those guys did. But, um, but yeah, definitely, I, I look back, you know, with what they had, you know, reindeer skin sleeping bags and, you know, eating pemmican and, you know, and stuff like that, you know, and dragging huge, heavy wooden sledges, you know, weighing 600 pounds. Uh, you, just, you just have a huge amount of respect, you know, for what they achieved, you know, back in those days, you know, absolutely. So. Great. 
Any uh, any final ones? Are we? Uh, I think we're probably. Yeah, uh, I think we're done. Well, you've been a, a wonderful audience, guys. And uh, oh, yeah, final one. Uh, well, it's kind of extreme. Oh, sorry, it's extreme solitude which you went through, and solitary confinement is one of the sort of cruelest punishments there is. So, what? How did you find that? And what did you learn about yourself in the process? Uh, yeah, definitely. Um, I think you really need to be, you know, completely happy in your own sort of mind and not have anything sort of, you know you're concerned about in the back of your mind before you go on these journeys and try to go with as, as clear a sort of conscious and, and mind, if you like, you know, uh, before you set off. And uh, I, I found, you know, myself reflecting back, particularly on the solo journey, looking at my sort of previous life, which it, in modern times, you're just so busy and you're constantly sort of, you know, looking forward. You, you, very, you spend very little time sort of reflecting back. And um, on, on this journey, I did. Um, and there was one particular thing. Um, yeah, I've got a son. And uh, when he was growing up, I, I got him into um, off-road motorbike racing, motocross, uh, from quite a young age. Uh, and I was definitely like competitive dad. And uh, you know, and I, I kind of started thinking that I maybe I'd pressurized him too much when he was younger, um, you know, doing these sort of races. Uh, and there was one particular weekend where we'd gone racing, it hadn't gone, you know, he was racing for a national championship, and it hadn't worked out. Um, you know, we had this bit of an argument at the end of the weekend. Uh, which I which I massively regretted. Uh, I remember I, I spent like you know a couple of weeks on that solo expedition, you know, with huge regrets, you know, and reflecting back, you know, how I'd sort of you know spoken to him and and the way I sort of dealt with it. And I sort of resolved myself that when I got back from this trip, you know, I would take him out. He's now 22 years old. You know, I'd take him out for a beer and sit down, and I'd just like pour my heart out and just say, "Son, you know, I'm really sorry about this incident that happened when you were like 12 years old. You know, it's really been preying on my mind." Uh, and I got back. Uh, and we did it. We went out for this beer, and uh, and we sat down. And I started to tell him about it, and he was looking at me and he was going, "Dad, what are you talking about?" Uh, and he had no idea, and he generally couldn't remember, you know, this particular incident. And I'd spent two weeks like beating myself up about this, <laughs> you know, that I'd been a terrible father, like, and uh, and pressurized him, like, you know. And uh, so yeah, so I think it's really important, you know, when you when you go down there, you haven't got these things, you know, bubbling in the sort of back of your mind, and you kind of go down. You know, with a, with a clear conscience, and then uh, and then right towards the end of the journey, I completely forgot about him because I was having massive food cravings, uh, and I then spent one whole day designing the ultimate cheeseburger, uh, and like everything I'd pack into this thing. And by the time I'd finished it, it was probably about four feet high, uh, and I remember I talked about it in one of the audio blogs. Uh, and when I got back to the UK, uh, we got this elderly lady lives next door to me in Hereford, and the day after I got back, she made me this cheeseburger. Uh, and bought this thing around, and it took the whole family of five of us to eat it. It was like absolutely it was like something out of Scooby Doo. It was uh, it was huge. So uh, <laughs> brilliant, great. Well, uh, now you've been a wonderful audience, and uh, now it's been an absolute pleasure. And uh, no, thank you very much. So.